I'd like for us to take a few moments to think about how it is that the river flows in such a way that it does refresh, renew, and restore us. Our lives began, as you know, in a garden, the Garden of Eden from which rivers flowed into all the known earth. Our story will end as well, if you follow the scripture, in a perfect garden with the river pure as crystal flowing from the throne of God. So this morning we will live and read from garden to garden, gardens from which the river of life does flow. We stand please as we begin our worship. We gather today as signs of the creator's handiwork, kingdom folks whose lives have their roots in God's perfect garden. Behold, it was very good. For a moment, let's talk Genesis. If you ask the person on the street, particularly on well, not too many people on the street with a church going background, but ask any around you this morning uh, what story they remember from Genesis. And, and I'm willing to bet that uh, maybe out of 10 will remember Genesis, where the creation, Genesis is where the creation story is. And it seems like for those of us who are Christ followers, that has become a central story. As I was growing up in Christ Church Northumberland, that indeed was the central story. In the intermediate department, as we began Sunday school, Mr. Fleming, our teacher, would stand in front of the room and he would begin every Sunday without fail in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness moved upon the face of the earth, and God said, let there be light, and then Mr. Fleming would flick the light switch on, <laughs> right above Solomon's head of Christ. <laughs> that seemed to be the central story. I remembered it, didn't I? If I asked my Jewish neighbor, what the central story of Genesis might be for his people, he might answer Genesis 12, the story of the call of Abram, the story which formed a people. And those prior 11 chapters then become prelude to the real story. They tell the Hebrew people that this God who called them is the God who created, the God who created by speaking a word. This is not the God who had a great struggle to overcome the demons of darkness or Leviathan, the sea monster, but the God who called in Genesis 12 is the very God who spoke creation into being a little different perspective on Genesis. Genesis 1 is a theological reflection in which we see how God moves from chaos to order as the spirit hovered over the face of the earth. I'd like for us to focus this morning, however, on the second creation story, one we don't get to quite as often, Genesis 2, beginning at verse 4. It's not so much a deep theological reflection as Genesis 1 is, as it is a story. It's a narrative. We read it somewhat differently. It's humankind's story, which me begins in a desert and moves to a cultivated world. The world that surrounds men and women. The world in which men and women are free to create with God or to destroy. It does in fact begin, not end, with Adam, the man, the first creature, formed from the dust of the ground in intimate relationship to the earth and placed in this beautiful garden, this park of which Yahweh is the owner. Side comment. 
because of that intimate relationship with the earth, it's a good thing for us to talk about fracking. It's a good thing for us to talk about landfill and the styrofoam that goes in it because the earth and we are intimately created. Following Genesis 2, our story begins in the perfect garden, Eden. Eden means delight. It's referred to by the prophets as the garden of God. Will you follow, please, as we read from Genesis 2, beginning at verse 4. In the day that the Lord made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground, but a stream, a mist, would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed out of, out of the ground. The Lord made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life, also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flows out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divides and becomes for branches. I'd like for you to read that last verse with me, if you will, please. A river flows out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divides and becomes four branches. Let's talk about that for a few moments this morning. A river flows out of Eden and becomes four branches. People have tried for a long time to kind of locate, if you will, the Garden of Eden, and, and you know, ultimately, it's kind of a mystery, but, but the writers ha were dealing with the world that they knew at the time. Typically, as I was reading several commentaries over the last couple weeks, people talk about two branches and try to identify them as the Tigris and the Euphrates. And we know that, remember that from, uh, from your social studies as what part of the world? The cradle of civilization, the fertile crescent, remember that? However, the scripture, I noted, says nothing about the other two branches. There indeed were four branches flowing out of the Garden of Eden according to the story. So I looked a little further and I found that some think, you know, there's nobody really knows but some think that perhaps the other two are the Blue Nile and the White Nile that join in present-day Khartoum, the capital of Sudan. The Nile is on, the only river in the world, as you'll remember, that rises near the equator and flows up, if you will, into the middle latitudes, irrigating parts of Egypt, Sudan, Ethiopia, and Uganda. A case can be made for humankind's beginning in the sub-Saharan Africa. Parenthetical comment here. Sometimes, as white Europeans, we see only that in scripture which affirms and identifies us. But what if indeed the river flowed into the whole known world at that time, which I think is the message of the story. It's a case being made for not reading scripture selectively, but reading the whole thing, especially from the point of view of folks who are sometimes left out. This is the Garden of Eden, and the world outside the garden is where people live. They are not the same, but the river that the scripture says waters the garden flows out of Eden and into the world inhabited by people, the world that was known at that day. There's a continuity from the garden of Eden into the world of people. 
It's not that there was a world of blessing in one place, that perfect garden, and then a world without anything good to recommend it somewhere else. The river flows out of Eden, becomes four branches. Typically four indicates the whole world, if you will. The Hopi tribe has a symbol I hope you can look at in a moment, uh, indicating the four winds of the earth. The Jerusalem cross symbolizes the carrying out of the gospel into the four corners of the earth. It means to the whole earth. Now I want you to see a corner of the earth for a moment just to see if you're awake. Will you put that up please? There you go. <laughs> the river flows from Eden literally into the whole known world at the time, including perhaps territories we have not considered. This morning I'd like to remember, to reflect upon the stream of living water coming from that perfect garden into our lives and to think for a moment where it is that streams of living water are flowing into your life. As I thought on this over the last couple of days, I remembered the story of being a, a young pastor and the operative word for beginning pastor is inadequate. <laughs> After two weeks, you know, in, in my first appointment, I had used up everything I learned. <laughs> and you know, as as pastors do, we find ourselves in places where there's nothing we can fix and there's nothing that we can say. And I was in that position with a, a woman of faith. Oh, she was well into her 90s. She was in a hospital bed. She couldn't communicate by talk. And, and so, I mean, I was really lost. I didn't have any other tools than talk, conversation. And I, as I stood helplessly there in her room, Mamie looked over toward the table beside the bed and indicated the little plastic cup of water. And so I grabbed it, so glad for something to do, and, and held it to her lips and could see the refreshment that came over her and could feel even more the refreshment that came over me. And that was one of many times when I realized that when our backs are to the wall, we're not sure what to do, what to say. There's nothing we can do or say. You know how God just kind of takes over? You know, it kind of goes into overdrive and we are refreshed. How has God's river of life nourished your soul? I'd like for you to think as well of someone whose life is parched and dry, maybe a wasteland in which no water is. Would you think of that individual or situation and lift it before God, someone whose life is a desert? How might God be calling you to offer the water of life to someone else? I know that this is not a perfect world. From that perfect realm, the rivers of water come to us John Wesley said, this world is our parish. Were we Lutherans, we would remember, and we probably do anyway, Martin Luther said, this world with devils filled. A river, four rivers. 
comes through the earth to renew and refresh. And the direction of history is toward another garden, a garden that we are called to till and to cultivate until that time when God comes to us and God is indeed all in all at some time we can't date or know or predict. The garden will come to us. Hear these words from Revelation 22, the first two verses. The angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for, are for the healing of the nations. In the beginning, God. In the end, God. In the end, big, inclusive, renewed city. Now, God. The river is here. Our gracious God, the river of your life is here upon us this day. We pray that you would help us to be faithful servants, O God, as we remember those whose lives who are, are parched and dry and whom no water is, that we, O oh God, might in this place and from this place carry the water of life, pour it out, and know that in the pouring we also are refreshed. Amen. <laughs>